to be here for this uh, for this first uh, Walter Wink conversation. Um, so for those who are um, who are maybe not aware about who Walter Wink is, um, Walter Wink was a phenomenal uh, New Testament scholar and professor um, who who talked about subverting powers, who talked about what does it mean to live in the dom domination system and what does it mean to fight? within the nomination system. And so as a person that uh, lives in the Bronx, who has pastored in the Bronx, uh, a place that is very much uh, affected by the powers that be, um, I thought to myself, um, what a wonderful way to explore the New Testament um, to be able to, to study the work of Walter Wink. Um, and I found that that this opportunity is available and open through the Fellowship of Reconciliation. So I want to say thank you to the Fellowship of Reconciliation for uh, for having this wonderful fellowship. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity, and uh, we are looking forward to being here in this space, the People's Forum, um, for you know the next two months actually. So we have for the second sun for the second Thursdays of uh, each month, at least in December and January, we'll be here. Um, in this space and um, and we're in the Claudia Jones room. Uh, we know Claudia Jones to be a revolutionary. And so we hope uh, that the spirit of Claudia Jones and the spirit of Walter Wink uh, fill this space and fill this room. Uh, and I'm looking forward to being in conversation with my friend Claude today. Yeah. So I'm gonna read just two passages. Um, of Walter Winks that I think uh, just to kind of ground us a bit um, in, um, yeah, in some Walter Wink texts, if that's okay, if that's okay. So um, the name of this uh, particular series is Wink Talks on Becoming Human. Uh, so um, in conversation with some of um, the leadership at FOR uh, in talking with and thinking with um, with June Wink, uh, who is who I got to speak with a few days ago, we were able to think about, we've been able to think about the one of the very last uh, works of Walter Wink, which is my struggle to become human. Uh, and so there are many, many, uh, there's many things that, that Walter Wink has done in his life. There's many things that he was able to, to write in his life, um, but this was one of the last uh, pieces of work. And this piece of work is deeply personal. Um, and as a pastor, um, I find it to be just a part of my own healing at this point. I'm actually like finding it as to be a, a devotional. So I'm, I'm taking bits and pieces of it day by day and I'm reading it. Uh, and so I'm going to start here um, because it kind of speaks to a little bit of where I am right now in my life and where a lot of us may find ourselves as we think about um, this post-election moment, as we think about what we've been through over the last three years. Um, and so um, as I read this, when we are finished, I'm going to ask us that we that we take a collective breath together, actually, um, just to hold space for ourselves and all it took for us to get here. Okay. <laughs> all right. And this um, this chapter or this couple of pages is called God in the Trees. It was the summer of my 19th year that I left my home in Dallas to work in an Oregon lumber mill without any friends thrown back on my own collapsed spiritual resources. I found myself one afternoon in a forest of virgin Douglas fir. At their feet were flowers 15 feet tall in full bloom. Previously, such a sight would have filled me with the adoration of God, for the beauty of nature had always been my most immediate avenue to God. But now, I felt totally alienated from what I had once held so dearly. If there was no God, there was no one to thank for the glories of nature. No other to meet me in the things that God has made. I tried reading my pocket revised standard version of the New Testament. Randomly, I opened to the book of Acts. The more I read, the more alienated I felt. The Holy Spirit poured out on the disciples' healings. None of it seemed possible. 
either the whole thing was a lie or at least most of it or else my world was a lie or at least part of it. Let's take a deep breath together. Ashe. I'm also going, going to read uh, a piece um, from The Powers That Be. Um, Fernando, uh, who was our, was, the, was the week fellow last year, did a powerful uh, collective uh, kind of space to read The Powers That Be together. Uh, and I actually got to read along with that group of people. And, um, and yeah, I'm going to read a little bit from that as well to kind of ground us in our conversation. The powers are inextricably locked into God's system. His human face is revealed by Jesus. They are answerable to God. And that means that every subsystem in the world, in principle, redeemable. Hi, welcome. The powers are not intrinsically evil. They are only fallen. Fallen does not mean deprived, as some Calvinists allege. It simply refers to the fact that our existence is not our essence. We are, none of us, what we are meant to be. We are alienated from God, each other, nature, and our own souls, and cannot find the way back by ourselves. But the situation is not without hope, for what sinks can be made to rise again. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. Um, I asked uh, June Wink uh, about a week ago. I said to her, what do you, what happens when you believe that, um, that the powers just can't be redeemed? What do you do? What do you do with that? And with that, I'm going to, I want to welcome Claude. Let's welcome Claude in a way. Um, Woo, Claude. <laughs> um, I invited Claude into this conversation because when I first uh, came to New Day Church, uh, one of the first uh, leaders that got to preach, one of the first lay leaders that got to preach was Claude. And, and Claude preached about um, what it was like to serve in the military. Uh, and to eventually choose the way of nonviolence. <clears throat> and so to choose the way of peace, uh, to choose the way of anti-imperialism. And so I wanted to spend some time today thinking about and talking with you about, about your journey and how did you get there and where you are now. And so in your own way, can you, can you talk to us about where you're from, where your people are from, a little bit about your story? Sure. Uh um, can folks hear me okay? Um, I don't want to have both computers on. Um, yes. Uh, so my both my parents are from the same town in Jamaica, West Indies, Old Dava. Um, and myself and my sister are both uh, first generation Americans here. Um, we were born and raised in New York City in Queens. Uh, and um, I'd say like our, our household was was pretty like apolitical, uh, but I went to Catholic school my whole life up until college. Uh, even um, really notably like the Jesuit high school Xavier, uh, where I feel like I did learn both about um, like in uh, the Jesuit like, uh, did not, uh, the Jesuit priests like taking on like an active role in like how they they are ministering to the world, you know, going to different places. But also, I did four years of JROTC while I was in there as well. So having that um, first introduction to the military, um, and uh, when I did, I had went to college. Uh, I started at SUNY Albany, um, and. Uh, I kind of had like the bird out the cage because I was a pretty much like very much a homebody um, growing up. 
And yeah, I focused on everything but my academics for the first year and a half. Mm -hmm. So when I was home and was thinking about going back to college, uh, I still felt like I wasn't there yet. And another option I had when I was in high school that I was considering was going to the military. Um, so I did, I went back actually to my high school and mentioned that that's what I was going to do. Um, it was like great to hear. And then I went to the, uh, to the recruiter. Um, and this was in May of 2001. Um, so, uh, when I, you know, there was like, you'll go for four years. I did a, um, airborne school cause an extra two grand. Um, at the time I thought like, oh, you know, maybe I'll do this. And I'm thinking of like, getting like a government job, like during the FBI or something like that. And uh, so funny to think now. Um, and, you know, I did airborne school so that way I could be closer to home. Um, I really didn't want to leave uh, the States at all, but I happened to be uh, in a, what's called the MOS, uh, your military, um, um, I'm about to forget, occupational service. Mm -hmm. I believe. Um, it's been a few years. Uh, and my job was actually phasing out of the army. And I happened to be the, the one person who had the MOS who left jump school and got stationed in Korea, um, which is about the farthest place I could go from being close to New York. Um, Cause usually you get sent to Fort Bragg. Uh, that was a very unique experience. Um, it was my first time overseas. Uh, I happened to be there when they had the World Cup, which was also interesting seeing all the different folks there. And um, yeah, also having learning about a new passion, which was soccer. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when I got to Germany, and, well, and clearly, um, so I, I got in the service in May 2001. When I actually graduated, my AIT was on 9-11 of 2001. So I was in the middle of the desert in Arizona, completing our training mission when uh, the lead um, trainer came out and told us in his uh, Humvee, who here's from New York or the tri-state, you know, the, the towers got hit. And the sergeant that was with us was like, hey, you know, stop messing with them. Like they're done. He was like, no, he's like, who here? It's like me and one other person we drove over. Um, the lines are busy. Uh, and the one thing I did remember was my dad used to work sometimes at the World Trade, fortunately he didn't that day. And, you know, and um, it's unfortunate for all those, you know, who were there. Um, even though I, I realize it's some years now, like people, 2001, it's 2022. Those people are out and about, like, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, when I entered into the uh, military, I, the most I had to think about was a peacekeeping mission um in Kosovo which was I was told the most I had to think about and now realizing um that we were a country at war uh so when I I did a year in Korea um from January 1st 2002 to uh, January 1st 2003 um there was the possibility of getting deployed to Afghanistan um but while I was there in April was when um we initiated the conflict with uh, Iraq. Um, and for those who remember, you know, it's being seen on TV. Uh, President George W. Bush gave a 72 hour deadline for uh, Saddam Hussein to say where all the WMDs were. Um, you can't say where something isn't. And, um, and you know, through the form, we did a shock and awe campaign of Iraq. Uh, and also on TV was seeing and announced that our unit in Germany would be one of the units after Fort Stewart, which is a unit out of Georgia, um, who's the initial, um, at least army, um, mixed in with, you know, uh, other armed forces to go in afterwards um, sometime in April. Um, we also was told that wasn't true until then they told us a few weeks later, we had gotten our orders to go <laughs> there in um in April. Uh, our original uh, time for deployment was six months. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if you want me to- Keep going, keep going, oh, keep okay. going, keep oh, going yeah. for it, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, it's very different than how it is in the movies. We have to pack everything up, make sure everything's correct, like going under Humvees, packing things in connexes. 
um, and everything goes by boat. So when we got there, we were, we actually got there before our equipment was. Um, I still remember we was on like one of those uh, assessor ride buses driving through the desert in Kuwait, like with all our gear on, like sitting and facing each other, not sure when we was actually going to get there. Um, it was about the worst kind of like military family trip um, <laughs> you could experience because I, I still don't even remember how long it was. But um, we did get to our location in Kuwait. Um, I think the first place we were at was called Camp Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, yeah, we were there for a few weeks because we had to wait. And I do remember just like a lot of us being nervous about like what this was going to look like, because when our equipment was going to get there, we were told we were going to drive from Kuwait into Iraq, which I was also like, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to this trip either. Mm. Um, and uh, I remember some folks would... Um, get nervous. I remember one buddy actually just kind of threw up as we like knew like the time is getting closer. Um, you know, and it's funny to think now like being in the desert, like having this experience, like and like you get like these. I mean, and you know, I I realized like having traveled a bit like in different countries, like the sun is different, the nights are different, you know, and like all those times like experiencing my first real sandstorm. Like it felt like also like kind of a little mystical at times, like when you see literally the sky change and like you're waiting for this expectation of like knowing like your life, you're about to enter into a real life or death experience. Um, one of the things I, I actually just recently had told my sister was like, they told us to make, to write letters, you know, in case something happens to us and to keep it in your Kevlar helmet. Um, so that was a lot at, uh, I think I was, 1920 um and most of us were around that age you know um and uh i still remember actually one buddy when we were getting deployed just had his first child so that was pretty heavy um but there was a mix of things folks saying like some folks might have committed suicide in some of the um in some of the porta potties that some people might have actually like done a uh, fratricide like because they were upset with like their um their command chain of command like not being considerate of like what was being asked to do like waiting there in the desert and also just hearing about folks who were of um middle eastern descent like also being ostracized like in in units um so that was like a lot to to take on like even before we had left um when we did leave uh it was something you know like because it just you know, we were there, we were worried about sand vipers, camel spiders, uh, just the <laughs> being in the desert. I remember one of the things I had uh, an issue with the first um, couple months I was there, something had just scratched across the lid of my eye. And like I had like um, kind of I couldn't always have the best vision in, in my right eye because like I think the sand had scratched something. Um, and I was actually the gunner on my truck. So I was like had like these chemical <laughs> like chemistry uh, goggles driving around as like we were going and I mean like it felt uh and like and also like a truck and all there was helicopters flying over there were deuce and a half there were humvees I looked in front of me I looked behind me all I saw was just like mm -hmm. it looked like some like Mad Max train like as we were going in um uh which was I guess also reassuring because I was like yeah I think we got this covered and also like wow this is what I'm about <laughs> you know um uh, but yeah, it was um, something where at least like a lot of us said, we all want to make sure we get home, you know, um, and uh, from what we heard in the news, um, the VAT party had pretty much had been defeated, more or less, except for certain cities, um, to Crete and Fallujah, of course, notable ones, and we found out there a few others, um, and uh, it took us about, about two days uh, to drive there. And um, I still remember one of the first things I saw when I got there that was very striking was like, we had heard like some popping. Um, and as he came up, like saw someone like standing over like a burning barrel. And as he was dumping the things in the barrel, the popping continued. And one of my friends was like, I think he's throwing bullets in the, in the barrel because it just sounded like, the I mean, that could have been made up, you know. Um, but it was just like very striking to see like this one person just off on their own. Um, and uh, when my unit uh, that I was with on um, the Second Armored Division, uh, we actually were stationed in Baghdad in the Green Zone. 
Um, so a lot of my job, which just to say was I was a 96 Romeo, um, which is a ground surveillance system operator, uh, didn't transition into working in an urban area like being in Baghdad. Um, also just not in Iraq because it was originally a position that started in Vietnam. Um, you'd plant sensors in the ground. It would help you locate personnel, um, light vehicles and heavy vehicles. In sand, sound doesn't travel that same way. Also, um, yeah, it did. <laughs> even we were like, this doesn't work, you know, what are we gonna do? Um, so when we first got there, we supported insecurity of curfews. Um, and that just felt also very awkward, like when I think about, because then it just was really policing, mm. you know, um, the communities there. And a lot of the folks that we would run into mostly were young kids um, uh, of various ages, you know, um, whether they were like fully orphaned or just like, you know, sometimes having to like go out and like resource for themselves from like the city. Because like I said, it was a shock and awe campaign. So a lot of things, except for a few places were blown up and burnt out. Um, uh, I'll say like, it was unfortunate to see where sometimes there were conflicts between neighboring families, like one trying to take their own house and like kicking out the other, or sometimes it, it escalating to further violence of where like they would injure or sometimes someone would be killed. Um, taking, supporting after raid and helping to load folks who would be detained, um, why we weren't sure. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a lot. Um, and um, we ended up actually being stationed, uh, my unit on, the number might be incorrect, but like the seventh wife's, uh, Saddam Hussein's seventh wife's palace. Uh, and we ended up sitting in like the servant quarters. Um, two things to note when we first got there was one, um, a sergeant of ours saw like a booby trap of a trip wire connected to a grade grenade. Thank you, Sergeant Short, for having a sharp eye. Um, we didn't know if it was active or not, but fortunately we didn't have to find out. Um, and also we found a gold AK-47, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, which all of us took pictures of. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was one of the things that like we saw in our own area. Um, by the main palace, though, where he had gotten blown up, um, the unit before us told us that they actually had to unfortunately remove some bodies. There were still folks removing bodies even mm -hmm. when we got there, but we didn't um, get tasked to do that. And for a while, we actually did have a de detainee center um, for folks on our, on our base. Um, which is also, uh, yeah, just a lot um, mm -hmm. because they're, I mean, it pretty much was just fenced off for folks mm -hmm. there. And um, I mean, it was in, in Iraq, like around the middle of the summer. Um, so like, I mean, they were just out there. Um, uh, I would pull usually security on some of the towers or um, we would also, besides doing security in the town, um, we would go to the Baghdad airport to receive resources and and when mail started coming in to pick that up. Um, mm. All in all, uh, the six months, um, we were there for one of the record uh, summers. Um, I'm really bad with Celsius, but I think it might've been around like 25 to 30, I think. Uh, extremely hot. Um, and uh, we actually, the time when we were supposed to leave was around Christmas. And that's when we got our extension um, for another six months. Because unfortunately, uh, the maybe just the US Army, but I feel most armed forces, we don't really change the things that we do. So uh, outside of just to Crete and um, Fallujah, um, the supply routes that we use, we pretty much made sure to use all the time. But no matter what kind of happened, no matter how many times it got, bombed or, you know, X, Y, Z. So after a while we had to stay because we had to guard those supply routes because mm. the um, the supplies weren't coming in. Like camps were getting at what was called level black where they were just having to resource what they already had on camp because nothing new was coming in. Um, so we went from being stationed in Baghdad to one of the outlining areas. Um, for my uh, unit, um, we didn't necessarily have one specific location for very long. We went to different locations. Um, some of it was in a town called Hilla. 
Um, most of the time, we didn't even know the name of the town. Mm. Um, we just kind of came up with nicknames. I remember one specific location we called the tomb because when we went to the building, um, it didn't have any working electricity. So we just kind of work looking for our flashlights to go in the bed and then going out on security. Usually it'd still be at night. Um, we were actually one at that location um, observing the pipeline that they had. Um, and we would watch as people would run through the desert, go take some oil. Um, we wouldn't stop them because, I mean, like, it wasn't ours, but we just had to make sure nobody would do anything um, to blow it up or mess it up. Um, another time we were watching a, a small, um, like, kind of a residential area. Uh, I still remember, like, where we were camped on this hilltop it was, like, a big... Um, uh, mold of Saddam Hussein. Um, and uh, our sergeant thought it would be funny to pee on it. And he's like, all right. Mm. Um, can, I, can I actually, oh, no yeah. problem. Oh, yeah. I, I think, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know about you all, but I'm like, this is like really wild to hear about what is happening, like in this whole other, you're 19 years old. Right. Um, I just want to name that. You're 19 years well, I old. I turned 20 because this was 2003. No, 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 oh, no I'm bad with numbers. 21. Right. So you're not even 21 yet. And you are coming from Queens in in like a place that, that you all have occupied, um, which, you know, I, I think I'm wondering, like, what does it mean for you now to tell this story? from this from at this age and and like yeah I'm hearing you like make the like connect the dots and and yeah like I I I think I'm wondering a bit and then you you've made an, a few more points about what it meant to um enforce curfew mm -hmm. and to feel like a police officer yeah. um and you're talking about violence and also like inflicting violence on really, really young people um, that are about your age or are different ages that are younger than you. Um, and I'm just, I, I, I think I just want to hold space for that for a minute is, is, is the age that you were and the young people that you got to see and, and, and the impact of that at, you know, at such a young age. I mean, we talk about how like the, the brain even doesn't, fully is not even fully formed or fully developed and yet we have like really really young people that are going into the military um and I, i'm just wondering like if you have any thoughts about that you know at your age now actually um i feel like one of the things uh uh because i've been fortunate enough to get uh therapy through a group mm. called headstrong um that uh allows for vets um who've been diagnosed with ptsd to be able to um, get free for like the however long you want to. Um, and something the other day when uh, talking with my therapist is I, I don't think about it a lot. I don't usually talk about it. Um, I mean, I feel fortunate uh, as um, it was shared. Uh, I'm an active member with I, I, what used to be Iraq Veterans Against the War. That's now about base mm -hmm. um, veterans uh, against the war. Um, and also a, a, vet, a Veterans for Peace member. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, I, I think it's good to support both. Um, it's just, you know, usually you can't, like, do mm -hmm. both at the same time, mm -hmm. but definitely uh, support and, and, and re receive support from both. Um, is, uh, yeah, it, it did open me to, like, understand the importance of sharing that mm -hmm. um, with others. Uh, but um, even just kind of saying right now and, and, uh, and I share with you, like, kind of doing counter recruitment stuff. Um, I feel like specific times when the first time that I did it was at the Mega Evers College mm -hmm. and getting to speak to folks who were looking to decide whether to have an ROTC on the campus or not. Mm -hmm. um, and just still thinking about, like, then and now, like, yeah, it, it feels very heavy, um, you know, because uh, I did that, you know, like, mm -hmm. and just even witnessing, you know, what I did, it's not even to say like necessarily how to do the things, but when you witness it and like you, whether you, whether I was aware of it or not, like I'm making a choice to say like, this can happen the way it is, mm -hmm. you know? And that's, um, and yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's very happy to, even now, especially also just 
later on seeing how things still developed, as ISIS came about, as there was the advancement of troops and more, and even now just understanding how like it's still ongoing but not highlighted um, because now we're in this, you know, un hybrid of unmanned warfare and contractors. So now it's not even like looked at the same way because it's not officially like the military that's has involved. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I mean, um, and this is just from my own experience and learning, becoming politicized and understanding the connections of how this all is. And, uh, and even um, kind of us has a lot of folks who came in like being young, being folks who are usually middle to lower class, you mm -hmm. know, um, folks who had experienced a lot of own violence in their life or trauma. Right. Um, you said they offered you $2,000. Yeah, to jump out of plane. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't just like, hey, here's two, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, jump out of plane. Right. Um, and, uh, but yeah, for a lot of folks um, who, you know, and it's still something that happens okay. now with folks okay. like, you can either go to the army, you go to jail. Mm -hmm. For things sometimes even one friend uh um uh a great artist kevin basil like when i found out that's what he had for like what was actually like not even really like it was unfortunate he got arrested and like it escalated where he had to choose mm -hmm. for something that wasn't even um like he was unaware of like that it, he would it would escalate to him having to even go to jail mm -hmm. uh yeah, yeah. um Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. I there are three things that I that I want to um that I want to highlight uh, about your life that I know of <laughs> mm -hmm. because I I met you through you know through the world of faith um and we know that like faith allows us to imagine otherwise possibilities um but you also talk about your work with about face um and I'm also really aware that you do some emotional release work mm -hmm. and so it feels as though you have um. There was a point in which you decided to change your life, you know, and so there was there was a step between coming home for you. And then there was also a step of, like I said, choosing the way of, of nonviolence or choosing the way of peace. Can you talk a little bit about about like what what made you choose that way? Um, well. Uh, it feels like there's a lot. Uh can you say the question again? Yeah, like what um what was the deter when did you decide um that you wanted to strategically choose the way of nonviolence? Well, I guess I'll put like a little asterisk to it. Right, because that's um, complicated, right? I right, do right. believe in nonviolence, but I also support self-defense. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh I know that can be complicated, yeah, complicated. Right, right um but i think it's been a process you know mm -hmm. uh because um i think well the place that really got me activated um was new day church mm -hmm. you know um and it started first in understanding how i was treating my family you know um how i was like the way i was trying to um alleviate myself of like feeling the guilt and and powerlessness of like, and this was, uh, I got out of the active duty service in 2005 and I, I joined the um, inactive ready reserve at a local unit here in um, Fort Totten because so many folks were getting reactivated. And when you got reactivated on the IRR, it just usually meant you were going straight to be deployed. Mm -hmm. so I said, I did not want that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, just to watch like, has it increased? for the now two fronts of war. Um, but yeah, um, when I got to New Day, uh, I was there for my nephew's um, uh, baptism. And and during the time I had actually lived with him, like for the first six months he was born. And I actually, like the thing that really started opening me up was like, you know, I'm not gonna say I was like at my best self during this time. So, you know, like, I felt like most folks were also treating me not <laughs> in the in a most loving and caring way. In reflection, I I know that's not true, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, sometimes you, you really have to also, like, keep folks accountable. Mm -hmm. um, but for my nephew, it was all love. You know, mm -hmm. like, he would see me, he would smile, we would play around. 
Um, and when I got to his baptism, um, the first thing that came to me was like, because also at that time, my sister said they were going to be moving out, um, was like, well, how am I going to stay in his life? And mm -hmm. also, what am I going to actually be able to do in his life if I'm like this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and that day, uh, Pastor Doug, um, who was uh, the pastor at the time, was talking about trust. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not only trust in God, but like how you trust yourself. Um, and yeah, that hit, you know, uh, and I signed up for Growing in Faith 101. I got lost many times trying to find it at first because I did not, I, I barely went to the Bronx. Um, and uh, I would say like, as it built up, I realized like uh, in wanting to like do something for another, like as I was starting to grow and understand myself, um, I understood like I had a lot of just guilt um, around um, how I played a part in in what was going on in the war um, uh, and how like, I mean, the thing that just, because um, there's also, I think, uh, I don't know how familiar folks is, are with this term also, but like dealing with moral injury, you know, um, when you know like something you shouldn't be doing, you know, is there's something that you know is wrong, but like you're still forcing yourself to participate in it. Um, and the and the hurt that that comes from there, um, because I definitely knew a lot of things that I saw and that I still took part in. I knew it was wrong, um, but I felt I had to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, that was something that uh, I felt once I did start to see like I could start undoing things. Um, felt like a good process, uh, but I felt like I was in a mind of like redemption and. And not that that was all bad, but like, I think you can't undo what you've already done, mm. you know? And I think um, in that way, I had just tried to do all the things and and it felt like I was kind of almost burning myself out, mm. you know? Um, and uh, I'll say at the time, um, I got involved in different groups to start understanding that. And at, around that, later in that point, I still was kind of able to functionally still kind of burn, you know, like be on the fringes of that because I felt like I was doing good work, mm. you know, but like, it's one thing when you're doing so much, but you're not experiencing what you're actually doing. You know, you're saying you're not doing enough. Still happens sometimes now, but you know, like I, I'm more aware of it. Um, but when I got to start doing the emotional release work, um, I think one thing uh, that really um, expanded this for me, because I'm glad how there's the frame of like being anti-imperialism, and even just being with about face is like, you know, for me, I've come to understand war is like the, the largest extent of violence you can have. Mm -hmm. And whether you're in the military or not, you know, like we all are, are under uh, a militarized mindset, you mm -hmm. know, um, because a lot of the ways like we understand when we're in this country is that we we acknowledge that violence can we we acknowledge or at least I'm not gonna allow feels, but um, there's still complicity to saying that we we allow certain violence to happen to say that it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. you know, like in looking at policing, mm -hmm. um, in looking at jails, you know, um, not that people aren't against it, but like we kind of still have to witness these things mm -hmm. and, and kind of be okay, mm -hmm. you know, um, even when we're not for it, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, uh, yeah, when I started understood that, because coming back home was re-triggering, because then I also was seeing the violence that was happening at home that I hadn't been aware of, you know, like seeing, especially with Mike Brown and, and all the, um, or even uh, before Mike Brown, um, Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. and starting to understand these connections that were going on. Mm -hmm. It was a lot, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, and, uh, and actually, that was one of the reasons we pivoted from Iraq veterans against the war to about face, because we did want to be able to frame that it wasn't just about the experience that happened in Iraq. It wasn't. We also kind of uh, realized we weren't acknowledging um, those veterans of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but it was also more even just understanding the militarism, excuse me, that occurs, starts here in, in, in the U.S. and how we, you know, depending on it, when you see gentrification and like, mm -hmm how now we're in a poverty draft, 
where the violence of people, you can pass homeless people who don't have any food and you have to be okay with it because the system still allows that to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, that you or yourself, you know, like have to be okay with like getting the minimum wage, even though you do so much more work and that you're in a system that gives a certain amount of people this level of profit that they ha they have no intention of giving to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and that we were in a government that, that also doesn't care about mm -hmm in the same way unless you force their hand to mm. um yeah 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 thank you for that mm. thank you for for sharing that I think um I have maybe like one more question actually for you and then I want to kind of open this up for folks um you talk about that you talk about what made you choose the other way um, was was choosing a community of faith, being a part of a community of faith, uh, experiencing this this new child in your life, uh, mm -hmm. who you wanted to be in strong relationship with. You had a desire to to be human, mm -hmm. uh, and you and you knew that violence was uh, the call to violence was in a, was in a way separating you from that, mm -hmm. uh, separating you from yourself, um, taking you away from your healing, right? Um, and you know, uh, there have been times in which I've heard you also reference uh, New Day or, uh, you know, the work in your church as kind of like also like kind of like your political identity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's not something that we talk much about. But um, given that we are like talking a lot about this New Testament scholar uh, and we're going to be talking about him over the next couple of months, I, I think, you know, it would be great to hear more about, you know, where you are now with your faith and where are you now, I guess, in your healing process. Um, I mean, it, I, I, we start kind of open up around emotional release work and the purpose of it. But if you want to share a bit about like where you are in your healing, that actually would be really great because, you know, um, yeah, like there's some really great work happening, I think, for you in terms of uh, where you have come um, in terms of, uh, you know, your movement work and also like where are you now just in your healing journey? Um, so, yeah, if you want to share that, that would be really great. Um, yeah, you know, actually, I just appreciate like when I saw the top before we started seeing the, the title of the Wink book, uh, My Struggle to Becoming Human. Um because, I mean, I think that's really sums up a lot of it, you know. Mm. Uh, I forget where I read it, but um, I think one of the things, uh, and I think this kind of goes across the board, like it, it, it was a Christian scholar or somebody who, who said this, but um, I think just like spiritually and even like thinking, you know, they had said like when you pray, it's not so much that you're praying like outwardly it's mm. just you're praying to be more in touch inwardly mm. um because you already have like that ability to be in touch with the divine in you mm. um and i think uh yeah there's a lot that uh like the world puts on us mm. to like forget how to be in touch with that mm -hmm. um and uh i feel fortunate that um that new day got me to a place where i could remember it and like work to be in practice with that mm. um one of the ways that I did for a number of years and at one time it was like uh this contemplation and lectio mm. practice um that I had done with some friends we one time we was doing it like seven days a week I'm still <laughs> and now um with uh two other folks uh we we work to at least get once a week mm. or at least for myself if I'm not able to meet to set a time once a week mm. and it's just looking at scripture and um well, first, it's the contemplation, which is like meditation and thinking about how to be in touch with yourself um, and being in touch with the divine and then reading a scripture. Um, and sometimes we would just look at other texts that that felt like in touch with that. Um, sometimes stuff from the New New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time we read like a Buddhist text. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, and I think, you know, it always felt on time reading something that just felt like that's what you just need to hear, you know. Um, and uh, and I always take it like, you know, having that contemplation and sitting with yourself, like being more open to like um, hearing a message, you know, because, um, it, you know, sometimes like I reflect on my day and realize certain things um, I was moved and touched by, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, just another practice of being setting intention, uh, saying like, how do I want to be for the day? If I have a meeting that feels challenging, how do I want to move into that? Um, 
And then the energy release work. Um, I'll say it's been challenging to keep up with because it does ask a lot of like bringing up the emotions that are hard uh, to experience. Um, and not only just at that time, but it, it really calls to say, you know, how are you living your life? You know, like what kind of um, media are you intaking? You know, like what kind of food are you intaking? Like, how are you spending your time? Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say one of these things, and, and my mentor, uh, Esperanza Martel, who developed this uh, under her uh, organization, um, Urban Out of X, um, we had this thing, 42 wishes that we have to do. And be 42 wishes you just have to do for yourself. Um, I remember the first time when I did the training, it was a 13 week training, I couldn't complete it because I couldn't imagine 42 wishes I just wanted for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was very, and excuse me, I've, I've worked with others to do it. And it also feels very daunting because like, sometimes we don't know what we want, which mm -hmm. is just like, if it's not inclusive of anybody else, what do you want? 42, you know? Um, and thinking of different areas of your life, in your career, in your finances, in your home, in your relationships, spiritually. Um, and, you know, hopefully you have a balance, but like, uh, and not only saying the 42 wishes, but then giving it a plan. Like, mm -hmm. it's not just to be, you know, Ooh, I'm going to do this, it's mm -hmm. going to happen. It's mm -hmm. like, no, how now how are you going to achieve this? Um, and I think uh, the one thing I really come to just feel that, that that always moves me that still want to you know make sure to be in spiritual communities because like I think you know um it really says at least as I've experienced it um is how we work and to be like our fullest self and our fullest self means like being in touch with our humanity you know and um and our humanity is very layered Mm. You know, like it's not only our mind, our emotion, it's our spirit too, mm. you know, um, and it's our spiritual connection to other people, mm -hmm. you know, our energy that we have, like, we can't just feel like we're cut off from everybody and we, like, the best thing is just to do, do you and like, keep it moving. Mm. That can be a certain way, but like, I mean, you know, um, it's, uh, I just think like, I'm in understand like me experiencing like being in touch with myself in such a deep way, being in community, even as challenging as it is, because even when you have the intention, you still have to go through your stuff. Mm. You know, um, I would have loved in different relationships when it happened, God had just sent an angel down and said, well, don't do that. Um, but, you know, like it's also just being in process of, especially because our society says you got to do it right the first time. I mean, it's not that you're doing it wrong, but sometimes we have to understand like, when we're coming from a way, a loving way, or, you know, like, just to really keep that mindset of like, also just being, you know, truthful to like how we want ourselves to be and how we want other people to treat us. Mm -hmm. um, so you went from, I, I just okay, want to, yeah. just to wrap yeah, this all right. up, I just want to name, so you went from this 19 year old kid, I, I actually am reading, Um, so in as a part of this series, I'm reading a bunch, of, I'm reading, also reading a bunch of texts about trauma, <laughs> actually, mm -hmm. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about how in, imperialism, militarism, how it just disrupts it disrupts so much from us. I'm reading The Body Keeps the Score for the first time. And um, and he says um, that trauma actually disrupts our mental flexibility. It actually takes away our ability to imagine. Mm. Otherwise, it, it literally disrupts our possibility to imagine. Mm. And so I think to, to see you go from a 19-year-old kid um, who can own, like, who is in the military, like, on, like, on the ground when there is a war to being a person in community that is healing for yourself, for your nephew, for your, for your family, for others. I think I just, I just want to name it. That's a really big deal. I, um, is that you have in a way you have, you have interrupted a really a cycle that not a lot of people actually get to interrupt. Um, and that just needs to be uplifted today. That's why I wanted to to have you in this conversation. So thank you for, for being in this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I want to also open up this space for questions for folks. Um, 
I know that we are, a lot of us are sitting up so in kind of like a post uh, election moment, as I said in the beginning. And I also just said that trauma interrupts our capacity to imagine. Um, and um, yeah, we keep going through the trauma uh, for sure. And then we have examples like Claude uh, who show us what it means to imagine, what it means to change our lives, what it means to go in a different direction. And I'm sure other people might have questions of, of him. I, I just want to say, Claude, that I'm really deeply touched by what you have to share. And um, when I think of uh, the way society is going and just the example that, um, you know, the United States, we have serial killings, uh, the mass, sorry, not serial killings, mass murders every day. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, as, as Malcolm X would say, that is the chicken coming home to roost because uh, we have violence uh, across the media, you know, mm -hmm. war. Uh, that, that has become the norm, uh, the modality of communicating, and particularly for people who are raised to be uh, men in the society. Um, you know, you go to... Uh, but like you said, ROTC, you go, you go to, to school as a, as a child and you're, you're told, uh, you know, you can uh, go to college, uh, join the army or work in McDonald's. And, and so when I hear what you, you you've shared a, just a, a little glimpse of what you've gone through. And I think now of this path that you've chosen, which is so brave and so courageous, In some ways, it would be much easier to to shut it all down because of the trauma, and and that's why people do things like kill others or you know have domestic violence in their homes. Or but 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 I'm deeply touched by your your bravery, your courage, and your deep connection to your light and love within and your your humanity as you pointed to this book and um, may god bless you may god bless you and protect you and i'm so happy to meet you okay thank you Uh, yeah, so there's a question in the chat. Um, Ariel says, Claude, can you talk about the effect of service in the military, even for those that don't serve in an active war? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Because um, I think it also speaks to one of the, when I mentioned about um, Iraq veterans against the war rebranding, um, is because we do also want to um, recognize and uplift uh, that the military itself is uh, is a violent institution, um, not only because of the violence it commits, but the violence that happens within. Um, it's patriarchal, it's white supremacist, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and you know um, it's unfortunate uh, the female veterans and like um, LGBTQ veterans that I've met uh, who share of the first, you know, with the um, the don't ask, don't tell, you know, having to um, need to be in the military for various reasons and, and not be able to fully be themselves, you know, and that happened. And I think, you know, um, just even being in the military, like, I, you know, uh, as a person, um, as a cis hetero man, you know, like, I still also had to, you know, realize I was being somebody else you know, to be able to serve mm -hmm. um, and to also have the layer of like, not only, you know, they ask that of you, but then also to have to include like with the donuts and, you know, before that happened, because that was during the time that I was in um, and the amount of sexual assault that happened in the military mm -hmm. and the way that they handled those assaults. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> I feel sorry, I can't remember the name, but I know also in Fort Hood, um, the young woman who was killed by her boyfriend and partner at the time um, when they try to hide it. Uh, the number of um, stories that I was told to me uh, 
like in our veterans group, just saying about how even the chain of command would be complicit of saying like, does, do you want to be to, you know, even name that the incident happened, um, especially for um, female veterans that are married when it happens like um, between two soldiers. Uh, and I mean, just thinking also about um, just the, depending on it, like, I mean, I didn't serve in the US, um, but just also hearing like folks that had to deal with uh, racist officers in their um, institutions and like whether that was like not getting promoted or having to do certain duties consistently that wasn't um, spread around to like uh, like other white soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you're not saving yourself from anything from not going to an active war duty from experiencing violence. Um, while being in the military. Mm. Mm. I hope that helps address that. Mm. Thank you very much. We have two more questions, actually. Yeah. 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 Um, I just wanted to add, I want to thank you first. Thank you so much. It's um, wonderful to know you. Yeah, but on to know you get the layers. Um, my question has to do with kind of like the present and how you make decisions with like anti-war decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like if I were military or had been, I feel like that would be like a really scary move. Um, I don't know, because I don't trust the government. Um, but kind of things like that, like how do you decide what decisions to make or what groups to kind of align with and how you like your visibility and things like that? Um, <clears throat> well, I guess not to be too dramatic. Uh, like when I understood like um, really what it means to be a black man in America, um, and just taking that in line, like, I feel like to think that there's like a level of safety that I can have by not being wanting to like implement these changes that I, not only beneficial for me, but like the community that I'm a part of, um, would be, uh, um, uh, like nonsensical, you know, like, uh, and in regards to the groups, um, I feel very fortunate, uh, that um, some of the groups, like uh, with my church, my family already was going there. Um, with my veterans group, I had learned about them through another group that I was a part of called The Mission Continues. Um, and just learning about uh, first that they had a, that they were using like looking at trauma and also working with Iraqis. There was this uh, Right to Heal campaign that Iraq, IVAW had done um, saying like the connections of like, not only us as soldiers are experiencing trauma, but those, you know, who, like, when we leave, still are experiencing in the country, those who are here, who know of their family members. So, like, when I heard that, I was like, oh, I feel like they're they're on point. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, there's some groups that I've been a part of um, where it didn't work. But, uh, I mean, I don't think that's because, like, sometimes just relationships and um, not because they're doing the wrong work, but, like, I guess we, you know, we're not jailing and those aren't my people. Um, but I think at some point, like I also said, like I can only be in so many groups. So, you know, depending on it, like who you're working with, um, ideally, as long as your values are aligned and like saying one specific thing, uh, you may not agree on everything, um, but uh, that's helpful. And I think to like saying from my own profile, um, like being visible in that way, I feel like since I'm in a group, um, I'm I'm part of a community that supports me. Um, so if something was to happen, you know, I feel like there'd be folks to show up mm. um, to help me out. And uh, yeah, and that um, yeah, and that that provides me at least like the the idea uh, and level of safety for me to participate. And I will say one thing um, because I I I haven't like been arrested in in certain things and uh and i think sometimes and i will say because like i also want to see i would want to be part of something you know it's directly doing something um if that makes sense and and i have had also the experience of sometimes when you're in a scenario and like if folks aren't thinking about when you have so many people of color and you're going to a place that's like trump country maybe you should bring more white people than people of color and that's just to say, like, if you're going to do that, if you, 
because um, in that way, or at least like make it clear that there is that that can be that level of violence. Um, to at least prepare yourself and like make sure that folks want to be engaged in that way. Because um, I I went in, I did was a part of an experience that um, folks were surprised at the level of violence, not only by the people that live there, but also by the police, who well, shouldn't have been a surprise, um, involvement in a line that that happened. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I, I want to take this a little bit. There was something Susan said, you can think back when you were 14 or 15, you show up at this Catholic high school after Catholic education. Mm -hmm. And was it like, here's the basketball team, here's the camera club, here's the junior Razzi. Mm -hmm. Was it that kind of normalized thing? Oh. I mean, it was just sort of another thing to do. Yeah. Um, and the, I think one of the reasons, like I knew when I got to high school, I wanted to like take part in different activities. Mm -hmm. I played sports, but I wasn't always good enough to make a team. Um, and I wasn't like super committed to be like, that's a thing for me to do. Um, and also my trip to school was an hour and a half each day. So JROTC met before school. And since I was having a problem being on time, I committed to doing that so I could try to work to be on time. I really didn't have much desire for that particular group. Well, when we say ASICs, when I was about that age, much way before the Vietnam era, mm -hmm. I realized later in my life, I was sort of being groomed by Marine Corps recruiters. Mm -hmm. I used the word groomed then, but it didn't happen. I didn't, but, but the reason I'm asking that, as you look at your situation now, what are the situations in your community, others, where that kind of grooming or attraction is is being put there for mm -hmm. 14, 15, 16 year olds. Mm -hmm. And what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. right, John, if you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, um, I share with Tabitha, I've gotten to take part in a few counter recruitment mm -hmm. um, activities. And I think uh, um, for myself, like I, I don't feel, besides like entering in the JROTC, where that was something right. where I had that approach, but like in taking part and seeing, like, especially being in the Bronx. Um, a lot of kids uh, who are, whether they're, you know, first generation American or immigrants themselves, see it as like a, a, a the ability to have that uh, earning, like being able to support their family, sometimes feeling like, well, you know, like it'll help me be more disciplined. And I'm like, well, you know, like discipline is actually something that we have to choose for ourselves. It's not something, you know, that we feel like we have to be controlled by others. And, um, and just, uh, like the amount of investment that like that gets put into that rather than like seeing other programs, you know. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's sad because like I mean, just you know, recently I just started teaching at a high school in the Bronx, and I mean, there's you know, gym isn't really even the gym I I knew when I was growing up. There's the you know we're fortunate to have an arts program. Um, I had music when I was in school that is not that same. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a transfer school. So it's also for kids who have had experiences in other schools and unfortunately weren't either academically able to be there or, you know, other needs that like need to be met. Um, and it's sad because you hope those kids get more support and ability to like have other programs to like have them be engaged. And there's no change of expectation for them in their work. Um, there's not enough funding for all the kids who, and like the ability to test everybody to see even if they are someone who might need that support, like there's not enough time or money to be able to have it happen. So you can see that th this kid might need a little more, but the process that needs to happen would probably, wouldn't have enough time depending on how the, the youth is to be able to even see that they're able to stay in school. You right. know? And Claude is also a teacher now. Yeah. <laughs> So like, so you're also maybe seeing also for yourself in a different way to school to military type. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. Well, we have two questions actually on, on, um, on Zoom. Ariel says, uh, as a faith-based organization rooted in the transformative power of nonviolence, do you have thoughts on how um, FOR can support veterans directly and or groups like About Face and Veterans for Peace? Um. Well, I'd say like partnering. Um, I, I think uh, 
besides like when you mentioned for this, I um I haven't heard at least within my yeah, I haven't heard of the group before, to be honest. Um and uh um I think there's something like uh the importance of having like that spiritual at least like awareness you know mm -hmm. um especially like as i mentioned around moral injury it is like kind of like in this space of like <laughs> because folks do recognize it sometimes as ptsd like um but it also you know when we speak of like a moral you know like where is that located in your brain or your body you know what i mean like but it is something that's acknowledged that does affect us um so i i uh, I don't know if y'all really like do much around that, but I think that would be great as like a group to just explore that, you know. Um, and because at least like for VFP and and about face, those were the circles where I even learned about that term, you know, and like come to understand. It. And it's not something exclusive to veterans. It's something like when you think about people when they have to make a choice, like are you going to do this or are you going to not, you know, eat tonight? You know, working at X amount of job or you know like when you're in those kind of like situations where sometimes you're doing a thing that you don't want to do. And that actually has you going against like your own values, um, which I feel unfortunate happens to a lot of folks. Uh, and, and maybe also just saying like, you know, um, at least especially with about face, like one of the things we always like with the right to heal campaign, um, there's also places where I learned about like other healing modalities. Um, I'm trying to remember this one. It's kind of like where you shake, but I can't, which is funny because that also includes, but it's, um, it escapes me right now, but I, I feel also VFP tried to do that. Like, you know, like also, um, one thing that I've gotten to take part in is like spiritual direction, mm. you know, and I think that's something that, mm -hmm. um, depending on folks, you know, like, yeah. uh, knowing about that process is important because I'm it's inclusive of, of, you know, uh, biblical text, at least for me, but like, I also know like a lot of it is just like having someone who looks outside of like the norm of like, you know, what do you, what did you do today? It's like maybe saying, how do you feel? Like what's on your spirit? Like, I still feel like folks can connect to that. Um, and also the stuff that you do <laughs> or know how to connect, you know? That's my, that's my favorite part about you is that you are so uh, connected to the, to the inside of yourself. Um, even after all that you've been through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have one more question online. Um, hi Claude. Thank you for your vulnerability and reflection and sharing this evening. I saw, I am wondering if you can share more about how, if at all, your experience in your youth with family and Jesuit Catholic school later influenced your intentional perspective on liberation and anti-imperialism in your spiritual practice. Hmm. Um, oh, wow. um, um, but you know, I'll say uh, something that uh, my mentor says when we do uh, our healing work is, as you heal yourself, you heal your family, you heal your community, you heal your, you heal the world, you heal your ancestors. Um, I think uh, the experience in my youth with my family and in Jesuit Catholic schools, uh, is just understanding like how this does like. Because militarization is just another form of oppression. You know, um, my parents are from Jamaica, West Indies, which used to be under England. And, you know, even though, like, specifically thinking of my dad, because I've come to learn he's a little more political than I thought, uh, or we I had experience, um, let me say, I never used to even think about that when I was a kid, um, was that uh, he understands what it is to be a colonized per person under a colonizer country. Um, and, you know, I think it's different in understanding, like when I'm born here, I'm part of the, <laughs> technically I'm on paper, like on the, have the colonizer, you know, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. like, and I know that's also complicated, like, yeah. Um, but just to say, because like, um, when I've gotten to speak with him about him understanding, like, 
his experience of like feeling oppression and like being here in the U.S. Like he doesn't see that as the same, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, um, and I think uh, I I receive his experience, and also I just try to think how um, not to make that connection for him, but just to understand like you know my parents never really had much to complain about this country because they experienced oppression different. And like, for me, like in the extent understand liberation, like it was hard for me when I started getting more politicized, especially remember this book uh, by uh, Jay Sakai called uh, Settlers, um, like the myth of the white proletariat to understand like sometimes how you have these history (laughs) when just quickly, like how it said, how I grew up believing that, you know, folks came here because of religious persecution. Actually, they came here because they just wanted to become landowners, which blew my mind. I was like, my nephew, I'm, I don't want anybody else to believe these lies. Um, but I think the thing is, like, my parents don't have that kind of connection because, like, they actually were colonized. Um, and and to, for me to understand, like, I am connected to that experience and, like, having to, like, be aware, but also my experience is different. You know, so like still holding those things to be true, you know, like I'm not going to vilify my parents for not understanding how things are going to be the same because I think they still do. But it's just like it hits them different. Mm -hmm. And and for me, you know, like it would bring me upset. But now I'm like at a place like they've never impeded me from doing the things that I do. And in ways they encourage it because like like I feel just in us being able to maintain a good relationship. So like that has me feel more liberated because like my family is also like in having good relationship allows me to feel more free to do the things that I do. Um, with the Jesuit Catholic school, uh, I mean, all the patriarchal things I did when I was a kid. Um, and it's an all boy high school too, you know? So like everything was kind of next level. But I, I mean, um, the one thing I, I really appreciate also in New Day that like frame for me is just even understanding like to have the framework that I can speak to God has a he, she, or they, you know, um, that there's the ability to, you know, I, I appreciate a friend of mine when um, he had said like, well, how do you imagine God? Like he imagined God as someone that he could love on. And I feel like I imagined God like the closest for me as a mother. You know, um, and not to say that Jesuit school didn't make that possible or told me that that was or like, you know, said any way that was wrong. But like there still was a rigidity, you know, like going to going to church and just saying like, you know, um, that you do all these steps. Because I was an altar boy for a number of years, too. And also, you know, I don't know if I ever mentioned you said, but I thought of becoming a priest at one point in my life. And I went to like this summer school. I, and uh, with the, some priests, and by the end of it, I was like, this feels more like a job. I don't even want to do this anymore. <laughs> um, and by do this, I meant like be feeling like active in my faith. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I came into New Day, like a number of things be like healed for me, you know, like even just being in connection with saying like, I do want to have this ability to be in touch with something that's like outside of me, inside of me, that moves me, that connects me to others. Um, and that like is something that's still more than I can imagine, you know. Mm. Any other questions? Good question. Uh, well, first, thank you for sharing. Like, it's just been really great to hear you say. Um, is there a significance to the number 42, the 42 issues? <laughs> Good question. Um, the number forty-two is a uh, representative gratitude. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so Claude went from from being very, very limited in his imagination to having forty-two whole wishes. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This this is kind of strange, I guess. But when you were describing the um. The, the rebranding of IPAW about mm. face and mm. how that also was trying to think about the militarism here. Mm-hmm. Um, is that, I guess I was wondering, is that like referring, does that mean that 
like about face is open to like say like former police or FBI or like other agents of the state that are domestic that are part of like the domestic militarization or is that like what does that mean when you were talking about wanting to also in include mm. um, militarization at home in like about faces mission right um I can say that wasn't <laughs> the original intention. Uh, but you know, it's it's funny that you bring that up and thank you for looking that up. Because one of our members who's not the member in Texas but is a former police officer. Um, and I think, you know, it's still something in development of when folks, anybody, not, whether you're formally like working for the state or not in that capacity, um, how we, uh, are able to work with folks who are in the process of like getting themselves politicized, you know, because some things they can, we can say like, we agree with and something are like, well, how can you still see, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Um, and that's whether you've been part of this, you know, like police or not. Um, I will say like when we, we did that reframing, it was to be inclusive of like the question before, like if you've never deployed, um, are you someone who, did you see yourself like being an IBAW member? Because we didn't want that to be a block. Mm -hmm. And also we just, you know, also in having members who weren't specifically coming from that experience, um, but yeah, it was still like a, a lot of real trauma. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I will say it's, uh, for me, um, I would be open to that, but I think that the thing is um, that uh, it just has to, what's the word? Um, we, about face would need to be able to work on ourselves to be open to that. Because um, I'm not saying we're not ready for it, but I'm not sure if we are. Uh, because um, it's one thing to understand, like, we're clear that, like, we're not proud of how we experience things, you know, um, how we, but, like, I also know, like, we have a lot of folks who are also, like, ACAP, you know what I'm saying? And and to say even as someone who was formerly police come in and would, because even when we had this one member um, come in, it, it brought up a lot of things, like, uh, and yeah, it's uh, yeah. yeah it just, I hadn't yeah. thought of that, and I was just like, that's really interesting. Like, right. that, if that's what you're implying, I was like, that would you know, there should be groups that would, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not uh, about face, but I feel like there should be groups that would represent like folks from those worlds that that have the same, you know, kind of change of heart or mm -hmm. like want to get out of the system and, and speak out, you know, right. nice if they had something that they could plug into. And, you know, the unfortunate thing, there are groups like that, but they're usually actually groups that make people believe in the, another way to use their violence mm -hmm. that will improve a movement that, you know, yeah. usually goes towards fascism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, I think you bring up a good point because like we can't say those folks don't exist. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you again, Claude. Um, it is about time for them to put us out. And I want to I want you all to enjoy these great donuts that were brought. Mm -hmm. Um, and so um I want to say thank you for the kickoff, uh helping me kick off this Wink Fellowship. I'm looking forward to December and and January. I know that we're gonna be in some conversation about popular education. Um, method through the lens of Bible study. We know that churches and faith communities have done Bible studies for many, 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 many years, uh, for centuries, you know, for a really long time. We, you know, come into this conversation around study and what does it mean to be an education space. And so I, I want to, um, yeah, just lift that up and I look forward to doing this talk again. And so for those on Zoom, I want to say goodbye. Everyone here should say goodbye right. to them. All right, I'm gonna we're gonna close this room. All right. Peace everybody. Everybody have a good night. <laughs>